Hi, I'm Mark Auslander. I teach anthropology and cultural production at Brandeis University. I'd like to stimulate a conversation about art and evolution, uh, beginning with Kiki Smith's remarkable work of art, Lucy's Daughters. As we prepare to celebrate Darwin Day, February 12, 2009, the 200th anniversary of the birth of Charles Darwin, the cultural production program is eager to promote conversations through YouTube about the relationship between artistic representation and evolutionary theory. 150 years after the publication of The Origin of Species, we hope to have a series of video-based exchanges on the following questions. How did Darwin visually represent evolutionary processes in his own notebooks and in his publications? How did 19th century cartoonists, artists, and literary figures respond to Darwin and to related developments in evolutionary thought? How have subsequent artists engaged with the legacies of Darwin? How have visual representations of evolutionary processes from children's books, to video games, to zombie flicks helped to mediate or fix popular or scientific understandings of biological and hominid evolution? Let's consider one of the most interesting engagements with evolutionary thought by a contemporary artist, Kiki Smith's 1990 work, Lucy's Daughters. I'm most familiar with a version of the work hanging in the Rose Art Museum collection, an enormous silkscreen cloth showing at its base a single female figure branching up and out into a profusion of about 60 female figures. A 1990 iteration of the work also consisted of 60 separate standing hand-stitched cloth dolls, each made of silk screen cloth assembled together in a corner. It seems to me that through these wonderful works, Kiki Smith is critiquing and powerfully undoing one of the most pervasive androcentric cliches in modern visual thought. I'm thinking of the standard image of the parade of man from knuckle walker to upright homo sapiens sapiens, nearly always figured as male and very often at the end of a line as Caucasian. It is through this visual trope that Darwinian principles have entered into the global visual imagination. In the first chapter of his book, Wonderful Life, Stephen Jay Gould ridicules the progressivist assumptions built into this parade of life visual cliche. He notes that evolutionary processes, in fact, are invariably characterized by copious branching, not by a linear teleological impulse towards ever more perfect forms. He is committed to debunking the image, but notes its remarkable staying power. He even offers an example from the cover of the Dutch translation of his book, Ever Since Darwin. This image flies in the face of his devastating critique of the whole idea that evolution equals progress. Gould notes that this progressivist schema far precedes Darwin. It goes back at least to Charles White's 1799 Gradations of Man figure. The table typifies the racist assumptions of the day, arguing that the Caucasian male is most distant from animal forms. I'd love to learn when this visual convention of a series of walking hominids in evolutionary sequence was first developed. But this graphic evolutionary schema is now, of course, a ubiquitous feature of global visual culture, promoting everything from bicycle riding to Lego toys to the rise of mandolin playing and even selling walking products. It's used to ridicule creationists on the Kansas State Board of Education and to chart the rise of iPods. Often these sequences end in a joke, for instance, prophesizing the consequences of fast food. Sometimes they critique our reliance on technology. But they nearly always retain male figures. This male-centered visual convention is both reproduced and creatively played with in this well-known Mike Peters cartoon. How different from this masculinist, linear iconographic convention is Kiki Smith's lyrical work. Smith explains that she was inspired by press reports of a posited common ancestress whose mitochondrial DNA is bequeathed to all humanity, who may have lived around 200,000 years ago. This posited common mother is sometimes called the mitochondrial Eve and is at times called in the press Lucy. 
after the other Lucy, the four-million-year-old Australopithecus afarensis, excavated in Ethiopia in the mid-1970s. This Lucy is said to have been so named since the Beatles' song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds played repeatedly at the party by the paleontologists celebrating the discovery of her remains. In contrast to the standard visual trope of male-only linear evolution, Kiki Smith's figures proliferate out through the cloth with prototypically female aesthetic form. I love the textures of the work, the clusters of shadowy women grouped as mothers, daughters, sisters. I love that they are different in sizes and shadings, in ways that recall sepia photographing and other older art forms partially effaced through the passage of time. They aren't striding out of the purposeful parade of evolutionary progress, but are standing still in graceful, almost meditative fashion. I love as well the traces of the artist's own hand implied in the delicate silk screening. Perhaps we are also meant to think of some of the oldest human art, the Paleolithic handprints on the walls of caves, in possibly distant traces of our ancient progenitors. Taken together, the sixty or so female figures arrayed across the shadowed, rippling landscape of the cloth might be shaping the form of the African continent, the ancient home of both Lucy the Australopithecus and Lucy the mitochondrial Eve. Perhaps the overall shape also evokes the beauty of the female pubic triangle, honoring the common vaginal source of all humanity, of all of Lucy's children. To my eye, the various clusters of women also recall the images of nucleic acid stains used in DNA research, the scientific basis for the reconstruction through the female line of our ancient lineage. Having pondered Lucy's daughters, it's hard to look again at the standard male-only parade of evolutionary progress images without thinking of all those who have been excluded from that stage, of the proliferating lines of daughters, mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, great-great-grandmothers stretching back across the millennia, delicately brought together in a wistful family reunion in this remarkable work. I'd love to hear your video responses about Kiki Smith or your other thoughts on how artists, novelists, poets, and other creative figures have engaged with evolutionary thought over the years. And if you can, please join us on February 12, 2009, Darwin's 200th birthday party at Brandeis University as we continue these conversations about art, representation, and evolutionary thought. Thanks.